Well, today we are opening up to Acts chapter 1 again, and we're going to be taking a look at verses 4 through 8. And the title of what we're going to see today is the Holy Spirit promised and his role. Let's look at those first couple of verses, verses 4 through 8 today. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when he when they, pardon me, had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we see here, is we see Jesus speaking to the disciples and those others that were assembled and gathered there together right before he is going to ascend into heaven. And he's telling them about this promise about the Holy Spirit. And so let's observe several things from the context of what we've just read, what we see in this passage this morning. Well, we see, first of all, there are gathered believers Followers of Jesus that are gathered together and are hearing from him. Now, we don't see Jesus face to face these days, but we as God's people still gather together to hear from him, to hear his word. They're gathered there literally hearing the word from his lips. We hear his word through the recorded word that we have in the Bible. We also see here that Jesus was calling them to not depart from Jerusalem. They're supposed to stay put. How many of you know that obedience can be difficult sometimes? We want to run ahead and do things, and sometimes the Lord just says, stay put. And that leads right into the next thing Jesus says. It's really building on the same concept. Do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. You're supposed to wait, to be patient. Patience sometimes is not what I want to do, and probably not what you want to do either. We want to get going. We want to get started. We want to be doing things. And Jesus is calling those that are listening to him here to wait in Jerusalem, to stay put, and wait until they receive the promise from the Father. That promise was the Holy Spirit. Now let's notice something else here as well. Jesus goes on to say, Wait until you have the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. So Jesus has made this promise. He has taken the message from the Father of the Holy Spirit coming after he, the Son, is going to ascend. So all three persons of the Trinity uh, working here in conjunction and harmony with one another. Verse 5, For John, that's talking of John the Baptist, truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So we notice that Jesus says there's going to be a baptism of the Spirit. And if we turn over to Luke chapter 3, we're going to see the context of John the Baptist even saying the same thing, prophesying the same thing. So Jesus says that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is different than the baptism of John, and John even said the same thing. So here in Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 16, Now as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John. So this is John the Baptist. The people are excited about what's happening under his ministry. And they're reasoning in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. So people were thinking John the Baptist is such a powerful preacher. He must be the Messiah. He must be the Christ we've been waiting for. But verse 16, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John the Baptist even prophesied that one was coming after him, the Messiah, Jesus, was coming. And he would baptize not just with water, but with the Holy Spirit. And that's referring there symbolically to the immersion of the Holy Spirit. You see, In the Old Testament, all of the followers of the Lord did not have the promise and the benefit of having the Holy Spirit. Under the Old Testament, only prophets and priests and kings for a period of time would have the Holy Spirit come upon them and empower them for a specific task or ministry or purpose. 
But now as New Testament believers, because of the covenant of Jesus' blood, we are completely cleansed from sin and the Holy Spirit can come and not just empower us, but indwell us, live with us. And we are his temples, temples of the Holy Spirit. Now I want to highlight one other thing here too, because sometimes uh, this I think is misinterpreted. In the last part of verse 16 here in Luke, John is speaking of how Jesus is going to come and Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That fire is not most likely a reference to the tongues of fire in Acts chapter 2 that is going to take place, but rather it is a symbol of judgment that not only will the Holy Spirit baptize believers and fill them uh, with the Lord's power and with his presence, but the Holy Spirit also will be the one who will be the instrument uh, in the Trinity of judgment. He will bring judgment upon those who reject him, who reject Christ. The Holy Spirit's whole purpose is to put the spotlight on Jesus. He always puts the spotlight on Christ to draw us toward him and help us to grow in Christ. But if we reject that drawing effect and that call to come to the Lord, we're rejecting the Holy Spirit's witness and that brings the fire of judgment. Verse 17 goes on to clarify this, why, why I'm saying that it's judgment here. His winnowing fork is in his hand, referring to Jesus, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So fire here in context is referring to judgment, and both are true. The Lord is our blessed Savior if we turn to him, but he also is the judge of those who reject him. He's the same God. He doesn't have a split personality. The, the point is, are we going to choose to reject him or are we going to choose to embrace him? If we reject him, there are consequences to that. If we embrace him, there are blessings and there is God's grace and mercy. Also, if we turn over to John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18, we also see the Holy Spirit's promise that Jesus is making back in our main passage today of Acts. His indwelling presence was promised by Jesus um, in John chapter 14. And it says this, 16 through 18. Jesus said, And I will pray the Father. So Jesus is praying to the Father for something specific. I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. There's the difference there. Do we receive God's grace, or do we reject him? The world cannot receive the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. And notice the promise here, specifically given to the apostles, but it's going to go on to be the promise for believers to the present day. You know him, for he dwells with you. It was still the old covenant. The Holy Spirit could simply empower them for service and tasks. But notice what Jesus says, and will be in you. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Jesus was not going to abandon them when he ascended into heaven. He was sending his spirit so that they would not be abandoned, so that they would not be orphans, so that the Spirit of God would indwell them, not just be with them, but be in them. Going back to our main passage in Acts, we see some other applications. We see those theological truths we've just looked at about the Spirit's baptism and His indwelling presence and the promise that the Holy Spirit would come and how there's this call to wait upon the Lord and wait for Him in His direction. The applications, I think, are pretty clear of our text this morning. Don't run ahead of the Lord. We need that reminder often, don't we? We want to get going and we want to get about different things. But sometimes... We need to just really be waiting on the Lord. So a clear application, just like the apostles are being told, and those gathered around listening to Jesus right before he's about to send into heaven, is that we need to wait upon the Lord, not run ahead of him. And then we see a question that I think is very interesting, because then, right on the heels of this, it says in verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, 
saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So we see them asking the question, maybe in a little different way than we are asking today, but I, I think we ask it much the same way too today. And the question is essentially this, Lord, why are you not establishing your kingdom right here on earth? Why aren't you coming? Why aren't you dealing with all the stuff in the world and just putting it into it all? Because we know you're the rightful king. Why aren't you stepping into that place of authority right now? And notice Jesus' response. It's very interesting. They ask him if he'll restore the kingdom to Israel, if they'll be restored to their power and their prominence, and if God's people will have the, the power in the world. Don't we ask that same question today as Christians? I think we do. Verse 7, though, And he said to them, Jesus answered, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. I think that's such an incredible uh, statement by Jesus because in response to their question, Jesus essentially tells them, you don't need to worry about that. Those times and those seasons are in my Father's hand. The, the Lord's in control. His plan's going to come to pass. But we don't need to be so wrapped up about when this world's going to turn around that we lose our joy and we lose our focus and we lose our peace on Christ. You see, there's such a focus of that, I think, even today. Such a temptation for us to be caught up on this same question as Christians today. Wanting Jesus to come back, wanting to predict the end, wanting to know what all's going to happen in the end times. There's still such a fascination with that among God's people today, is there not? And yet Jesus is telling us, don't be so worried about that. I believe what he said to them is applicable to us. Don't be worried about the times and the seasons. He's going to go on to say something else. There's something we should be more focused on than what power is reigning in the earth today. And so we go on and we see there that Jesus says in verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus basically bypasses their question in a sense. He, he doesn't give a lot of attention to it. He's kind of like, yeah, you don't really need to know about that. That's in my Father's hands. You don't need to know the time and the seasons. But he gets back to what he was saying. Not many days from now, he'll be baptized with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he talks about you will receive power. And there's going to be a mission that you're going on. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has saved us for a purpose. Now, we're not called to run ahead in our own strength, our own way. We're called to be filled with the Spirit and to receive His power in order to do this calling Jesus has given us. But Jesus is calling us to live life under His authority, not our own power. That's a clear application here. Also, I think we're reminded that under His authority and filled with His Spirit, we will receive the power that we need to witness. We cannot do it in our own strength. And there's an urgency here, an urgency that they weren't supposed to be so focused on when is the moment and what's the sign of Jesus' return. They know he's going to return, but they're to have a sense of urgency. You know, I think this is a very astounding thing. The New Testament writers write in such a way that they have a sense of urgency, that Jesus could come back at any time. And throughout history, you will find generation after generation of believers believing Jesus could come back at any moment. And there's a sense of urgency. And I believe that's why Jesus does not give us the sign to look at. Because when we try to hack Bible prophecy and we try to figure out the end, we get focused on the opposite of what the Lord's called us to. We're getting focused on details and what's going to happen next rather than recognizing there's an urgency. And every generation of believers should have that sense of urgency about Jesus' mission and should recognize we cannot do it in our own strength. We need the promise of the Father. We need the filling of the Holy Spirit that now lives within every single one of us as believers. They were experiencing for the first time in Acts this blessing. Every single believer today experiences this blessing. Over in the book of Romans, it tells us that if we do not have the Spirit of God, we are not Christ's. You can't be a Christian and not have the Holy Spirit indwelling you today. What was happening here in Jesus explaining to them the Holy Spirit was coming was unique for that time and that place. It was the very first time this was happening. But for us today, it is a present reality for every single believer since. All right. We also see this, that under Jesus' authority and being filled with his Spirit, we receive the power to witness, that's part of his promise, 
But then one person has said it this way. We received the power to go to Jerusalem where they don't like us. Jerusalem did not like the Christians. They had crucified Jesus just a short time before. The power to go to Samaria where you don't like them. The Jewish people did not like the Samaritans. They considered them half-breeds. They considered them turncoats. They considered them followers of a partial false religion. They did not like them. And yet you're going to go there in the power of the Spirit to take my word and to the world's end. Let's pray today as we, we wrap up looking at this passage. We've looked at some theological truths. We've looked at some practical applications for us. And I don't want to go too far in going on in Acts today. We're just going to stay with these few verses. But let's pray what we've seen in this text in our own life. So if you would bow with me today and let's pray this. Father, we come before you and we thank you that you sent your only begotten Son to die on our behalf and to save us. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have not left us as orphans. Help me not to run ahead of you. Help me to rest in the Holy Spirit being my helper. Direct my mind and heart to your word, to your kingdom and not the conditioning kingdoms of this earth. Father, help me even today as I wrestled with a particular situation where, Lord, it just seemed like you were convicting me of I, I need to, to look at your way of doing things and not have my eyes on this kingdom. Father, help me to simply wait on you and to obey you, even when it's uncomfortable to walk in your power rather than having my eyes on the things of this earth. Father, help me, help us to rest content in maybe not knowing what I want to know, but knowing that you hold all things, and to rest content in that, to cast my fears and my concerns upon you. Lord, I need your promised power, and I need to rest in it to be your witness. Thank you for providing everything. Thank you for this promise and thank you for the role of the Holy Spirit being the helper that we need right by our side and in us. Thank you for being everything, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that I pray in thankfulness today. Amen.